I can't say your, your indigenous name, Charles, so you can say that yourself. <laughs> but Charles, he's a former blood tribe chief and grand, no, 3D7 grand chief. He was born on the Blood Indian Reserve in 1949. Since the early 80s, Charles has worked hard to advance many health initiatives to improve the health care outcome for the people. As director of the treatment center Nappy Lodge and Poundmakers Lodge, director of the Blood Indian Hospital in the early 90s, and as chief executive officer for Blood Tribe Department of Health, a post he held until his successful election as chief of the Blood Tribe, <coughs> subsequently leadership from 2004 to 2016. Charles continued to maintain an interest in working with the University of Lethbridge and the Lethbridge College in advancing the lifelong education goals of our indigenous members. Charles Rieselhead was officially installed as chancellor of the University of Lethbridge during the spring convocation ceremony held May 30th, 2019. Currently, Charles is also a member of the Blood Tribe Department of Health Board of Directors, Aboriginal Liaison Red Cross, and Indigenous Knowledge Wisdom Center Board of Directors in partnership with Treaty 6, 7, and 8 provincial and federal education departments. And just to add, I spent six years on the, on the UFL, UFL Senate, and I was lucky enough, my last year, uh, I was lucky enough to serve under Charles. It was very refreshing to get an indigenous, indigenous perspective on the way things are run. Without further ado, I invite you to give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much, Kanud. Nishwana kog tachi ki poya, kiti kskoka na eksimatsimpuwa. I'm just so pleased and happy uh, to to be here with you. Uh, when uh, Knud first uh, made mention that he would like to invite me to come and share a bit of uh, the stories that in my experience, you know, relate to recovery, addiction, uh, health, uh, and, and those uh, type of things, you know, so I didn't hes hesitate. So I'm very, very pleased and honored to be here. So uh, with regards to shelter and homeless, I understand that's uh, probably a large portion of, of my dis discussion uh, at this point, you know. But before I do that, I thought I, I perhaps maybe should backtrack a little bit and provide a, a bit more information on, on some of my experiences. Uh, as part of my work since the 80s, the early 80s, I've been involved uh, with alcohol, drug uh, addiction, uh, now it's recovery and addiction, mental health, you know, th those type of things, you know. But there are certain uh, uh, kind of in between things that when I entered into politics, but health was uh, definitely one of my uh, b bigger files, you know. I'm I'm really uh, I'm really uh, always looking at data. You know that's important for me, so that we can provide uh, the best supports, the best programs, and re recoveries uh, th that we have. I've got a, a personal uh, journey after my retirement. You know, well, my wife said you're semi-retired because you spend more time away than you were the chief the last time. You know, so <laughs> she may be right uh, at this point. You know, but I have a, a personal passion with uh, addiction. I have a young son 
an adopted son who's uh, uh, trying to uh, get out of the cycle of addiction and homelessness, you know. So I'm in Lethbridge two or three times a week to check on him to see how he's doing, you know, those, those type of things, you know. So the Lethbridge uh, shelter, uh, I, I never had too much contact and connection with that in the past. I didn't have much information on the people, but I, I do understand what, sh uh, what the shelter provides. I do understand where the homeless people ha have come. And I don't think I I it's a big secret, you know, because some of them have gone through life, uh, perhaps, uh, with great difficulty and, and challenges, you know. I just read, read most recently that Toronto has the highest homeless and, and shelter people, over 10,000 people in Toronto. And perhaps Vancouver is similar to that here. Now, here in the city of Lethbridge, you know, that's the first question I asked. How many people can we identify as homeless and, and being on the street and in the shelter? We have approximately 220 to 250 people here in the city of Lethbridge, you know. Uh, now, further to that, 70% of those people are indigenous. 70% are indigenous. And in my line of work, you know, it, it really saddens me, you know, and it's, it, it's a burden, you know, uh, for our indigenous population because not only are they overrepresented in the shelters, but they're overrepresented in the court system. They're overrepresented in the un un employment, you know, child welfare, and the list go goes on, you know. And there is a history of the information why why that is, you know. But we don't have time today. Maybe. Perhaps Knud can invite me again and we can talk about some of those other issues. But information, data is really important for me, you know. We also understand that indigenous youth are the fastest growing population in the country. And that m might be great, but we also understand that homelessness is uh, the age is getting younger and younger and younger. You know, the youth, and probably because some of them are in, uh, caught up in addiction, you know, and of course poverty, all those type of things, uh, lack of uh, affordable uh, houses, that's why we're, we're seeing the people on the street and uh, using the, the shelter. So, how did we get here? How did the Blood Tribe Department of Health uh, begin operations January the 2nd, uh, 2023 of, of this year, you know? So over the years, in my role as whatever, we've had many discussions with the City of Lethbridge, with the City Council, with uh, the education uh, system, with AHS, with economic development, uh, because we are uh, very close with regards to be, being uh, neighbors, you know. And, uh, and let me just point out uh, one, one, one quick uh, study that I uh, entertained uh, for the Blood Trap Department of Health. I refer to it as the economic leakage study, okay? So the dollars that come in onto the reserve, whether they're government uh, uh, program dollars, whether they're own source revenue, and uh, that type of thing. So I, I, uh, we hired a chartered uh, firm, an accountant firm, to give us, once they enter into our community, where do they go from, from there, you know? So one of the key findings that we had was that the city of Lethbridge in any given year receives about uh, 
50 to 60 million dollars a year from the community from the blood reserve. Whether they're in the schools, and we've got probably over 800 K-12 students and 800 uh, <coughs> university students as well too. So, uh, and, and it could be higher at some given years for whatever reason. Town of Carson receives about 22 to 25 million dollars a year. So we realized where all of those dollars were going. So hence, we uh, decided to come up with discussions with Lethbridge where we can uh, provide support and you know, especially with the young people in education, you know. I'm really high on education because I really believe that, that that's the ticket for our young people to get out of where they are, education. And uh, I, I will continue to uh, advocate on that. So anyways, um, going back uh, to do today, we entered into a relationship with the uh, uh, the mayor and city council. The mayor and I are co-chairs for all of the indigenous health programs in the city of Lethbridge, you know. And so there have been discussions with the city councils in the past. How can we work together? How can we accommodate each other so we wouldn't see the street people? So the homeless population does not continue to grow. The long and short of it is the city uh, of Lethbridge and the province of Alberta decided that perhaps the best way to transition was, was to have a different operator at the uh, shelter. And that different operator happens to be the Blood Tribe Department of Health, you know. Now, I'm, I, I must say I'm not an expert by, by no means with regards to that. Where my expertise lies is I mobilize resources. I can mobilize programs and services so that we can provide the best practice approach to any challenges uh, that we have. So subsequently, the discussion and the agreement was entered into. We transitioned, I believe Alpha House was the one that was op the, the operator. So we changed hands, Blood Tribe Department of Health took over uh, January the 2nd. So what different uh, uh, programming are we talking about? What different programming are we instilling? You know, I often re, re, uh, uh, say um, with shelters, it's almost a, like a revolving door. They come in, they sleep, they go back out. They come in and sleep, they go back, back out. Nothing really happens to them, you know. So the de Department of Health, with our resources and our, our mandate to care for our, our people, are introducing introducing a wellness model, okay? So we're going to utilize the wraparound services that we have from the from our community, and hopefully from the city of Lethbridge. You know, uh, one of the other key things that I must mention that in the, in the last little while, all levels of government, uh, both the province, the federal, and our indigenous governments have sort of understood that if we don't take care of our business, the opioid crisis, the homelessness, it's going to overtake our young people, our communities, our cities, and perhaps our small towns at some given point, you know. So something needs to be done. And I'm very, very glad, you know, that uh, this, this uh, government has taken a broader and kind of a robust you know, uh, activity to provide the support for our people. We have entered into another agreement with the province of Alberta where we've already designed a 75-bed treatment uh, center on the, on the reserve. Perhaps you've heard that there's a 50-bed here in the uh, city of Lethbridge on the east side by uh, South Country Treatment Center, I believe it was, yeah. 
I worked as the director when it was Nappy Lodge way back in 1980, so uh, I know the place well. So once that 75-bed treatment is developed, we also brought in a detox format, a detox pro program right into our community, bringing the spirit home. And we all know what detox is about, leading to treatment, uh, post-treatment, uh, and those type of things. So once we establish fully our treatment, our 75 bed, along with the 50 bed, that's the kind of work that our case managers, you know, that we've introduced into the shelter. We'll begin the triage of these clientele, you know, how old are you, what's your education level, all of these type of things and we'll try to encourage them once they come out of the shelter to go into detox, to go into treatment, to go into post-treatment, to go into community integration, you know. You know, I, I, I've, I know a couple of young people that have their degrees that are walking the streets and all we need to do is just pull them out of that cycle and get them into detox, to treatment, to help themselves, you know. Now, I've said quite a bit, uh, our mandate is to operate a shelter, we realize that. But if we continue to operate like before, nothing is going to happen. Remember the old saying? If you keep doing the same things, you're going to keep having the same results. And that's not what we're, that's not our in, in, intentions, you know. So, uh, there's, the shelter operates on an emergency basis, you know. So one of the keys right now is the uh, city has 110 spaces for us to operate. That's all we can do within guidelines, restrictions, and liability but there's 220 people out there, you know. So again, we'll go back to the province. Uh, once, we, uh, once we gather the data and let them know we need more spaces, you know, for the interim, you know. Uh, we need more funding for, for, from the province to operate and fully utilize all, all of those services that, that we have. The other aspect that we're working with is uh, some of the current programs that are in the city, Leth Lethbridge Housing Authority, Aboriginal Housing Authority, you know, because the simple, uh, I guess, solution for the homeless is giving them a house. You know, it's not as simple as that, but that's an important first step. In my view, and mostly everybody's view, it's a human right for people to have a roof o over their head. And I, I realize it's difficult uh, considering, you know, today, today's uh, challenges with our funding, with programs uh, being put, put into place, you know. So that's the other uh, aspect that we're working with the uh, resources here in Lethbridge, you know. We're also uh, mobilizing our tribe to build more housing units, you know. We're also taking a look at tiny homes that we can build, you know, uh, hopefully here in the city of Lethbridge and also in our community where we can house them, you know. Temporary housing right now is probably, <coughs> excuse me, temporary housing is probably the only accommodation that we have for these people, you know. But once we can hopefully go down the road and be able to provide uh, more permanent housing for them, however way that we can, we can continue to do that, you know. So prevention is another key uh, important aspect of this whole thing. If we had the ability and if we all work together, we must remember that uh, poverty, that home homelessness, all of these aspects, it's everybody's problem. It's not just one designated uh, group problem. It's everybody's uh, pro problem. So what if we were able to accommodate and we were able to give a hand up to these 20, 
220 people, and the, the majority of them were able to go and find a successful uh, quality of life. Imagine what it would do, not only for the, uh, our population, but for the city of, of Lethbridge, you know. So those are some of the uh, plans that we're doing. We're also going to be working with our wraparound services. Let me know when there's five, five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, with our wraparound services, you know, that we're going to be providing mental health workers, case managers, we're going to be hiring navigators, you know, to go out, uh, employment opportunities. We've got job skills program, we've got life skills program within our, our tribe, you know, so that we will continue to provide as much resources and programs that are going to help them get back uh, on their feet. So what is the best pathway to recovery in housing, you know? First and foremost, you know, uh, one, of, one of the things that we want to do uh, with our staff, with our HR, is to let them know these people are human beings. We must treat them with dignity, we must treat them with respect, with love and care, first and for foremost. We need to uh, provide that for them. And plus being neighbors, close neighbors, the proximity, we'll have uh, medical units, we'll have uh, mental health workers, we'll have case managers, we'll have support workers, we'll have uh, representatives from housing, from those type of things, beginning to look at the data and how we can uh, round, round the corner, you know. We're also going to provide cultural and counseling programming, you know, because a lot of our elders uh, uh, from our communities and perhaps elders from here can be part of that uh, a process. So that's what we're, we're, we're trying to implement. I didn't realize 25 minutes this goes, goes like that. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to introduce is the human aspect to the shelter op operation and to the ho homeless, homeless people. So we, uh, we've asked everybody be patient with us and hopefully we have a one-year agreement. If things can work out to what I believe they will and can be, we'll be able to go back to the province and, and rewrite the agreement for an additional year or, or so forth, you know. But that is the plans that we're doing right now with that, you know. So we've made, uh, we've made uh, uh, tremendous uh, uh, leaps and, and bounds in this short short pe period of time. I'm not sure if uh, some of you read Lethbridge uh, article a uh, week, uh, week and a half ago. One of the vendors said, this new operators have done more in four weeks than the last operators did in four years, you know. So again, we bring uh, hope we bring uh, as much of our expertise uh, from the community, but we also want to uh, let the community of Lethbridge, we need your assistance, we need your support, and we need your patience on, on this uh, journey to wellness for those 220 people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. That was a encouraging words from you. I'm really happy to that you guys are in charge now. Um, I should mention that Charles is uh, pretty soon you're not going to be the chancellor anymore, which is to me very sad because Charles ended up being chancellor during the pandemic, so he wasn't able to spread himself around like he usually does. So I was advocating at the university that he should get, be given a second term, but, uh, you know, rules are rules, even if they're not common sense rules. <laughs> if you can uh, line up along the wall and uh, ask your questions without 
telling us your life story. That would be great. <laughs> and Charles will be answering the question. So let's go. Hello, Charles. My name is Henning Mundel. And I have two quick questions. In your presentation, you emphasize the importance of data. And I have a, one quick question is, of the people you're dealing with, what percentage have an addiction to drugs or alcohol? And the second one is you're out taking over the shelter and you mentioned that 70% of the homeless people are indigenous. Who deals with the other 30% and how? Uh, on the first question, question um, the general answer is the majority of them are addiction. So it could be as high as 90, 95% of them are addicted. Your second question, because we operate on a shelter, a shelter basis mandate, uh, we're going to take care of everybody. And I, I, if I fail to mention that our programming will also be flexible, will integrate both cultures, both information that's going to be uh, doing that. And that's the importance of our case managers. Once you sit with the individual, they will, uh, pro uh, they will be able to extract information, you know, that's going to be, uh, you know, uh, relevant to that in individual, Thank you know. You I, th okay, and the shelter operation is just having a roof over the head, a mattress, and food for them. But beyond that, we can offer uh, support for them as well, too. But it's going to be a, uh, not an indigenous program, not a blood tribe program. The uh, responsibility still rests with the uh, Lethbridge uh, City Council. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, for a very interesting and positive uh, presentation. I'm Maria Fitzpatrick and worked in corrections for 32 years. So um, my question to you is, um, we often say that it takes a community to raise a child. It takes a community to address the concerns in a community. And certainly this is a concern. So how do you encourage our community uh, to participate in a positive way to make this a success? Great uh, question, Maureen. Uh, what, what, what we're doing right now is we're, we're just putting together a communication strategy, uh, sort of a, a friendly, uh, friendly connection to the community, whether it's individuals, whether it's vendors, whether it's associations and organizations, you know. So part of that communication strategy, we're not, it's not just person to person, mouth to mouth, but we're going to try to uh, uh, put together uh, some li literature and documents for circulation. And perhaps we're working with the city of Lethbridge through the uh, health table to sort of, uh, you know, broadcast that, that information, you know. So at this point in time, we don't have all the answers. What can the city of Lethbridge provide to us? We don't know that, you know. We have some ideas. We ha also have some ideas what we can use, you know. There was a lady who said there were some towels. There, there she is. She said, that we have, I have towels for you for the, uh, for the uh, shelter. Things like that are, are very, very helpful and supportive for us. Little things, big things, whatever they are. Thank you. Hello, my name's Darlene McLean. Um, I was wondering if you knew right now how many homes are boarded up on the reserve and does those numbers and if they increase, how does, your, it, in, it, how does that affect your operation at the shelter? And last year I was at the recovery camp on the reserve a, a couple of times and what the, the success of those recovery camps and the data and the actual accountability and uh, professionalism of the treatment centers on the reserve, how does that affect 
your operation in Lethbridge and are you in communication with these people that run treatment centers uh, on the reserve and run recovery camps and that board up these houses? What is your perspective on that, please? <coughs> with regards to the uh, uh, relationship that we have with the treatment centers on reserve, because uh, we are the blood trap department of health, we operate the detox and we'll be operating the treatment center uh, next year. So we're definitely hands-on with regards to that relationship. As far as the boarding of houses, I don't have that information offhand. But when I was, uh, when I was in the position, one of the key things that uh, we mentioned was that renovation had to be a big part of uh, the program in housing on the reserve, you know. So just for a, a quick count right now, and uh, this is information about three to four ye years ago, we're definitely behind about 800 to 1,000 homes on the reserve. So to be able to house comfortably all of our, our residents here, you know. So again, can't speak for the leadership uh, right now, I'm not par part of that, but definitely we are looking at ways to expand, you know. We introduced a multi-unit, multi-level housing uh, qu quite a while uh, when I was in term, so again, we're hopefully going to enter into those. But roughly, boarding of housing, houses, I would say there's probably about 50 to 75 homes, if not more, you know. And I do realize, uh, just from observation, that there are some uh, people that have taken the initi initiative to refurbish and to uh, reconstruct those homes, you know. But definitely, housing is the biggest problem in our, our community. My name's Mike McKaig. I appreciate your talk today, Charles. I noticed that you didn't mention one of the, I don't know whether you'd call it a dirty word or not, but my wife and I were quite involved as volunteers at the SCS when it was open here in Lethbridge. And I strongly believe that once it was closed, uh, we started losing a lot more people to the drug addiction. I'm wondering if there's anything being done by the, the your department or by the, the Blood Tribe with respect to safe consumption to try and keep people alive so that they can get into the other programs. Uh, I, I can't speak uh, on behalf of Lethbridge. They're responsible for the consumption site. But I'll, I'll tell you, uh, one thing uh, is that we operated a, a consumption site on a, a mobile consumption site on the reserve and uh, there is a, a little bit of a different perspective from our community and the elders with regards to consumption sites. Although it was open, we didn't have very many people accessing that, you know. So as far as the Lethbridge consumption site is concerned, we, if it's required, if it's needed, we can probably provide support to have it happen again. But at, at this point in time, we're not responsible for that. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for coming and speaking to us today. <laughs> A few bath towels. <clears throat> um, during the years we've lived here, decades, we've um, often given things to the shelter under various iterations. Um, men's shirts, men's underwear, pants, boots, socks. Um, things for women too, but we know that population is mainly men. Um, so I'd like to know what kinds of things you need because um, in the past we brought blankets and uh, they were washed and reused in the past, in the recent past. 
Um, I hear that they didn't have blankets. So we're wondering, do you need blankets, sheets, pillows, pillowcases, towels? And then uh, I have a question in regard to some of the young women I've talked to in the tent city when it was just out here. And they said under the previous iteration of the shelter before you came, they were afraid to take showers at the shelter because the door locks were broken and so their privacy was compromised. I wonder if the shower doors have been fixed. And the other question is in regard to sleeping arrangements for women whether the women can sleep separately from the men. And sleeping arrangements, generally, people said that when they slept, their items were stolen. Thank you so very much. Your name? I'm Bev Mendel Atherstone. Thank you. <laughs> See, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. For, uh, first, uh, with the towels, if I can get a card or a contact person that they can communicate with and then we can set up uh, sort, sort of that uh, discussion with them. Uh, yes, security, privacy, confidentiality, all of those things are highly important. If I go back to my statement, these people are humans, they require that confidentiality, they require that privacy, especially with our women, our females. So they are working on the security. We were able to do a walkthrough before we agreed to take over. So those things were taken care of. And of course, you know, the activities that happen, it's going to be a constant maintenance of all, all of those things, you know. So we're very, very uh, uh, big on making sure that there is uh, privacy for everybody, especially the females. Thank you for that. And what can we donate? What? What can we donate? What can we donate? At this time, I, I prob pro probably what, what, what you're doing, clothing, you know, uh, both men and, and ladies, are cl clothing are probably the best things that I can think of right now. Thank you. You bet. Klaus Jericho, Charles, thank you very much for your many positive words. Uh, Klaus and Jenny came to Lethbridge in 1969, and we were exposed to the native imagery at that time which was not positive and it didn't and it lasted to be not positive for about 50 years and i'm so curious as to why did it take so long for us to hold hands and save and and, and solve our common problem why all of a sudden we know what to do Great question, and it's pretty loaded. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, when I went to high school in Calgary, I was uh, selected as the best integrated student. I went to Expo 67 for 10-day free trips, you know, so whatever I did must have worked, you know. De definitely, I, I think uh, because of the jurisdiction, because of the system, and because of the relationship uh, has not been great, let me put it that way, over the course of time. You know, but through education, through our young people being able to integrate into mainstream, whether it's uh, employment, whether it's uh, school, whether it's uh, uh, part of their career and stuff like that, we've been able to work together. But I, I think the, the, the common denominator for the whole thing right now is that the relationship that we've had in the past has not worked. And we've been able to see that not only for, from individuals, but from groups and collect, collective uh, organizations, you know. Does it have anything to do with the truth and reconciliation? Some of it is, you know. But I think the bottom line to this whole thing is that we're not going away. They're not going away. We need to 
uh, build a healthy relationship where our young kids can prosper, they can get educated, they can grow, and we'll make Southern Alberta the best community to live from here on in. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I wish you were still the Chancellor. <laughs> uh, I know this uh, so Sorry to see, see you in the, uh, during the pandemic and not being able to go to convocation. Uh, I was wondering um, if you, you feel that the courts should be, oh, I'd like to see them a lot stricter with the drug dealers, Is, and then because they're not going to like your program because they're going to lose customers, lose money and they're going to fight you as much as possible. Whereas I know if I was a judge, 15 years for dealing drugs, no parole. You're not getting out. And plus a million dollar fine. Because I, I, read, I read that this guy's got 150,000 cash in the back of his truck with guns and machetes, and he's out on the street. It's just, did you think that you can uh, push the courts at all or talk to them. <laughs> it's, uh, I just think it's, they're, they're going to fight you as much as possible in selling drugs because they're not, they're not that hard to catch. You see them, you know, the police know where they are. But, you know, it's catch and release. <laughs> what do you think on that? I agree with you 100%. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that, that's one area that we don't talk about too much anymore, and it's crime prevention. You know, what, what, what are we doing so that we can in intercept the delivery of, of drugs, we can catch the culprits, we can do this, we, we can do that. It seems that we're doing the same thing over and over again. I can speak about my community, you know, we haven't moved too far with regards to crime prevention. And that's a big part of this whole scenario of lowering, you know, drugs entering into communities, you know. And perhaps their hands are tied or perhaps they're overwhelmed. I don't know. But we need to talk a little bit about crime prevention. The other thing is prevention especially the young kids, you know. Young kids are getting into drugs younger and younger and younger, you know. Look at the school systems, you know. And we have that, uh, we have that problem at our schools, you know. So what, what are, are we doing? So again, I, I, uh, when, when we mention it takes a whole community to take care of this issue. It's not just the people that work in addiction and recovery and crime prevention and shelters and homeless. It's everybody. The education system, the health system, volunteers are needed everywhere. And I think uh, what, what is required is for us to be truthful about what is happening around us, especially in my community. I think we still have some pe people with their head in the sand and pretend that there's not a, a problem. And if we continue to do that, it's going to get worse, if not, not better, you know. The flip side to this whole thing is our community has uh, been able to, uh, over the course of time, bring our expertise and our capacity to the highest level it can be uh, at this point in time. We've got six doctors on, on the reserve. 95% of our health em em employed people are from the reserve. Nurses, you know, podiatrists, all, all of them. In education, 95% of our teachers are our, our people. That's the flip side of it. But we've forgotten to take care of our children as they're growing up. You know, to give them and instill those values and principles that are going to lead them in, in the right path instead of going with these wannabe gangs and stuff like that, you know. 
And so that's the reason why uh, this, uh, the outside community is now turning to the tribe, especially the blood tribe, Department of Health, and saying, we need help with our homeless. Come and help us. Bring, on your, bring in your Blackfoot model of healing and recovery. You know, we also have our hands dipped into the Fort McLeod detox. We're helping them there as well, well too. So I can honestly and truthfully say our expertise at this point is at the highest level. If we can provide employment opportunities for our young people, it's going to go a long ways. There's only so much jobs in our communities. So I advocate to our young people, when you receive your education and when you're ready to go to your first job, think outside first before inside so that we can have your knowledge as you get older and bring back and, and serve in, uh, our community as well. You know, So that's the type of things that, that we're at, at this stage with. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Really en enjoyed that very interesting talk. My name is Violet Meekma. I have a couple questions. So if you could just tell us a little bit more about the makeup of the people you serve. I understand the majority are men um, and that the majority are indigenous. But I'm wondering um, if there are any families that come to the shelter. I'm also curious if you know the statistics on the ages of the homeless people and if there are homeless families in our city. So if you could comment on a little bit more of that. Thank you. Uh, definitely 70-75% uh, indigenous young, ages between 25 to 50 in that age group. A lot of them are uneducated, uh, unemployed, no housing, family uh, disconnect, you know, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a, the family, uh, and getting into the wrong crowd, and of course, uh, drug depend dependent, you know. So again, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the biggest challenge that we have, is these are probably the most vulnerable people that, that we have, you know. And what can you offer somebody that uh, is at 50, is uneducated, doesn't have a home and stuff like that. So we really have to dig deep down to try to find out what kind of basic necessities that we can provide for them. At least uh, some semblance of a quality of life for them, you know. So it's going to be a, a difficult a journey for everybody, you know, because there, I, I don't know how much percentage of them are, we're not going to change them. They're always going to be who they are with regards to homeless, poverty, addiction, and stuff like that. All we can do is provide them some comfort, some hope, and some happiness for them. Thank you very much, Charles, for your presentation and giving us some hope. I'm Mary Shillington, and we've been involved. We by uh, I, I'm on the Justice, Peace, and Social Action Committee at McKillop United Church. So we have done a lot of work trying to educate both ourselves and other people in our church community, but the wider community around uh, reconciliation and and trying to be more faithful in, in treating everybody the way you want. You're trying to treat the people in the, in the shelter. Um, so my question is, uh, as you look at groups of people that you want to pull in, have you considered that there's a number of churches in this city who, who are concerned and would like to be part of that pulling in and, and working together with you and to help with the homeless and, and to help with the shelter people? We, we've done 
buckets of laundry for the shelter of previous people. I'll tell you, uh, uh, almost ruined my old washer uh, <laughs> trying to do some of it. And, and you know, there's people that would like, like Bev said, would like to make donations. So that kind of information out there and how, how we can help and support your staff there that are working there. What can we be doing? There's a whole variety of things that are going through my mind. So I, I, I'd appreciate hearing some of that. Mary? Yes. Blanket exercise. Hmm? Blanket okay. exercise, yeah. We're doing the blanket exercise on the 11th of March with Tony Snow. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, meetings like this just kind of open up ideas and connections, you know. And uh, definitely as part of our recovery system, spirituality is a big part of uh, who we are. But definitely, the churches, if they're available, if they can support, uh, we can certainly talk about those type of uh, activities, you know, that's going to help, you know, uh, our, our, our people, you know. So I think the ideas coming in are getting larger and larger. Uh, I have a good friend of mine, his name is uh, Tom Jackson. I, I don't know if any anybody knows Tom Jackson, you know. Him and I go back a long ways. Uh, actually, I'm going to meet with him Saturday. It's the second meeting. So I'm go we're going to bring in Tom as sort of uh, the poster, uh, I can't say child, because <laughs> he's a year older than I am. <laughs> but to help bring awareness and that spirit of uh, reconciliation, you know, not just to the clientele and to the families, eh? Because I think the families are still the biggest supporters. Like, I was just at the shelter before I came came here with my order of McDonald's and cigarettes and that type type of thing, you know. But definitely, we can. I can certainly uh, relay that information that the churches are wondering. How, how we can help. We're also going to bring in, uh, for example, uh, three supporters, counselors, mentors, navigators, and we have uh, former Judge uh, Langston uh, as well, one that we've identified can, can help us, an elder to come in, you know. So we also have some very, very difficult uh, uh, homeless people, they get violent, eh? because if they're under the influence of the drugs, they get very, very violent, you know, so we also have to be careful, but we are going to be asking people that have perhaps some knowledge and influence how they can calm and how they can, you know, get them back on, on, on track, you know, so, but great idea, I'm going to relay that, that information. Thank you very much. I know this lady well. Um, you know, uh, Carol Sakia, sorry. Um, back in January this year, this group was told by, I forget who, that the homeless count in Lethbridge was over 400 now. So your data is a little out of date, Charlie. Anyway, um, I want to know. What kind of staff turnover you have had to go from the previous employer at the shelter to your your staff, and if any people left or you know whatever, because there's going to be a change of attitude, and not everybody maybe will agree with how you hope to see the world, and so I'd like some idea about that. Um, and then my other question is about. Um, can't let child welfare go, right? Um, so it would be nice if I could think that the world had changed in, in the child welfare system since I was in it. But um, <clears throat> it seems to me fetal alcohol damaged babies come into the world. We as a system don't treat them adequately, properly, whatever. Um, and these babies grow into damaged youth, damaged adults, and they, I, th you know, back 
to my training, um, they need to be managed differently than you and I maybe coming from our mothers to school to college and you know whatever. So I, I think there, you know, it's wonderful that you're looking at things like spirituality and getting elders involved and stuff like that. But I'm I'm worried about the damaged individuals, not just Aboriginal, but <clears throat> there's a lot of damaged people by alcohol in utero that are going to fall through the cracks. And how do we ever deal with them adequately? You know, that's my thing. Thank you, uh, Carol. Uh, on the uh, numbers count, uh, we, we do re realize, you know, it's uh, up and down. There could be some that are couch uh, surfing. There could be in the uh, justice legal court system, that type of thing. There could be some that come out on the street but have a home and go back, you know. So definitely uh, that's sort of the first guess at how much are the real hardcore sort of uh, is around the 250 mark. In on your second uh, question, we did offer any staff that wishes to stay with the transition, that they're more than welcome. We do have uh, some of the staff from previous that are still with us, working with us. I just don't know exactly how many of them there, you know. And so it's a, it's a rebuilding, it's a resetting of perhaps some philosophy with regards to how we're going, going to operate. And at this point in time, we're taking huge feedback from the staff themselves. Are we do, doing it right? You know, what needs to be, what needs to be changed? So we're being very flexible. Although we must remember that we only have a one year contract. And of course, you know, it's hard to, you know, hit the ground running in, in most of these cases. So it's almost an observation by ear, by mouth, by eyes with regards to what is the best way that we can continue. But because of what we believe in and what you know we know from the past, I think we're, we're, we're going to keep going down the road and just taking a, a look at feedback and all that type of stuff to provide the best uh, uh, safe place for these in individuals. Thank you, Carol. Oh, uh, on the child welfare uh, case, you know, uh, we have a crisis on our hands. With the uh, FASD, we know the numbers are extremely high and they're not going away. And that's one of the most difficult things, you know, that we're, we're challenged with, you know. And without saying this, without saying that, you know, whether it's federal funding, whether it's support, whether it's trained people, whether it's having the right policy and procedures in place, you know, those type of things, something is going to crack as far as child welfare, not just in our tribe, but throughout our ind indigenous communities, you know, and, uh, you know, Rhonda is still working. <laughs> My wife worked with Car Carol, that's why I know. Uh, she has, they both have the toughest jobs as far as I'm concerned, child welfare, and dealing with these uh, uh, da damaged uh, children in, in some cases, you know. So I, I do know something has to change and I, I keep trying to get into the door, but you know, unfortunately, they're doing their thing. Thank you, Carol. Tell, tell everybody this is the last question, and I don't have to be on Good afternoon. I'm Dave Mabel, uh, retired. Uh, Newt asked me to let you know this is the last question, but it's an easy question, and it's for you. Uh, can you remember two dates? On September the 15th, we are presenting at CASA uh, a the updated version of, of uh, New Blood, which is a uh, dance 
and music and video and whatever production uh, that began in Strathmore with the Six Sigma uh, students and the, the town students at Six Sigma. It's now its ninth year. Uh, the, the director, Deanna, is from Lethbridge. Uh, and uh, so she has, we've booked the date with her. We booked CASA. And this is obviously open to everybody in the public. Uh, if you, I think some people here may have seen it before. It has been updated with the recent findings of the grave sites and so forth. Um, I'm looking forward to it myself very much. And also next Saturday, not this weekend, but next Saturday, the 11th, we are doing uh, the blanket exercise, which is a different way of, of learning about how things happen in this country for better or mainly for worse. And it will be at uh, McKillop at 11 o'clock on the 15th of 11. March. 11th of March. Uh, I've gotten the 11 and 15 minutes up. Yes, the next Saturday is the 11th, David, remember that. And uh, everybody's welcome, uh, no cost for that one, obviously. We will be, uh, because of the cost of bringing the people down from, from Strathmore, we will be obviously having a charge, a, 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 door, a door charge for the 15th of September. We hope to see you at both. And maybe you can come as well and, 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 and say hello and, and speak to the people. Thank you very Thank you. much. Is it Dave? Yeah. Dave has a radio or TV broadcast voice. Did you hear that? <laughs> it just comes out. Works for newspapers. So that's the end of the question period. Uh, Charles, do you have a take-home message for us? Please uh, instill some some concrete steps that we that everyone could take to improve the situation. Thank you, uh, Knud. Uh, I think that the questions uh, that were uh, forwarded uh, speak for themselves. Uh, I think at this point in time, uh, uh, the bigger question for us is uh, what are the expectations uh, with regards to the uh, shelter and, and for the homeless? And how can we work uh, together? How can we uh, share the expertise? How can we share the resources, you know, so that we can, uh, that the shelter can shut down when there's no more homeless people in, in the shelter? That's the goal, you know, that we want to reach together. And if, if we can do that, I can tell you there's going to be a big sigh of relief and a great big thank you from the Black Tribe. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming today and staying a little bit extra time.